Hello, my name is Anna Bartels and I'm with the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. Um, and we are here to discuss with you today the state health agency role in community health worker workforce development. I'm joined by two of my colleagues. Hi, I'm Takom Tarona. I'm a senior analyst for Clinical to Community Connections at the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, uh, where I support organizations, integration work, and projects related to primary care transformation. Hello, my name is Darrell Fox. I've been a community health worker for almost 30 years. I work for JSI out of the Atlanta office, working on community health worker health equity related projects. And I've served on the founding board for statewide, regional, and national CSW associations and currently serve as a founding board member for the National Association of Community Health Workers. Thank you. Great, so first order of business, we have no financial arrangements to disclose at this time. So in our time together today, um, our goal is that participants will be able to walk away with four key learning outcomes. The first one is to illustrate the critical role that community health workers can play in advancing health equity and improving overall access to care. Um, and the second is to define the potential benefits of limitations across a multitude of financial options that states are exploring to support their CHW programs. And third is to assess lessons about how financing, certification, and training interact in state considerations regarding CHW workforce development. And finally, we hope that you'll be able to identify some strategies states are using to engage CHWs in state policymaking. So we will be presenting um, three chapters um, today. So the first one will cover workforce development and certification for CHWs. And this would include a discussion on how state health agencies can support CHW workforce uh, development, as well as the various CHW certification paths that states are um, exploring. In the second chapter will provide an overview of the various financing options that states are using to um, support CHW programs. And the third chapter will focus on the importance of CHW work voice in uh, policy making. And, and while this section is dedicated to highlighting this topic, CHW uh, engagement and voice are proprietary components for each of the um, chapters that we'll be um, covering today. I also want to note here that um, the slides you will see throughout the presentation go into more detail than we have time to say today, but we do encourage you to refer to them as a resource. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ekwon. Well, in Chapter 3, we will focus more on uplifting the critical voice of community health workers and CSW leadership in every chapter of CSW workforce development and sustainability. Um, we really want to start by talking about engaging CHWs by tapping into our role as change agents and as health equity warriors. As many of you know, CHWs serve as facilitators, links, the bridge, the connector to information, to services, to care, and to treatment, and also to resources to address the social determinants of health. CHWs have been serving many roles during COVID-19 pandemic including as part of contact tracing initiatives, delivering food, PPP, PPE, and other um, items needed by their clients as they continue advancing health equity and health literacy to assist our clients and communities in navigating COVID-19. Next slide, please. In the mid-2000s, the, the American Public Health Association Community Health Worker Section led an effort to develop a national community health worker definition and to submit that definition to help create a U.S. Department of Labor standard occupational code. Those efforts were successful with the creation of the code in 2009 and also with the creation of this nationally recognized definition you see on the slide. Some key components of the national CSRB definition are that we are frontline public health workers who are trusted uh, members of and or have a close understanding of and connection to and including trust with the communities that we are serving um, in the role. And those roles include, um, as I mentioned earlier, as a liaison link intermediary or bridge between health, social services, the community, all done to facilitate access to culturally appropriate care services and for overall wellness in the community. Next slide, please. We also just wanted to take a moment to talk about the uniqueness of the CSW workforce. Uh, we work and provide many services in the com in community and clinical settings and also within diverse care and service teams. We're unique because of our ability to navigate those teams 
those communities and those systems of care um, and those and those services by using our expertise, which is shaped and based on our shared life experience and using the shared cultural experience with our clients. We utilize knowledge and skills that's been honed by training, core training, continual training, and CSWs provide whole person care focused on addressing all of the social determinants of health while being guided by the principles of trust, shared decision-making, equity, social justice, and empathy. Next slide, please. CHWs have um, many skills, and on this slide, you'll see the list of the national list of core skills and three of the CHW key attributes from the National CHW Core Consensus Project, also known as the C3 Project. Some of these skills include communication, interpersonal, and relationship building skills, as well as outreach, navigation, and assessment skills. Some of the key attributes for a CSW workforce that are valued are the connection, the connection to the community, to the systems, the credibility within the community, and their commitment to the community in providing quality, competent, and culturally appropriate care and services. Thank you. Next slide, please. What you see here is a depiction of the approximately, a sample of the approximately 50 different titles that CHWs fall under. CHW was developed, um, the term CHW was developed back in the 90s as a way to create a, a national link between the 50 some odd titles in each one of the regions of the state. It was a way to help us unify behind and organize nationally behind a title that was common that people could understand and embrace. Next slide, please. CHWs also provide services in diverse areas of public health, community, health, and social services. Here is a list of some of the areas where CHWs have general knowledge um, and some of the skills that we receive in many trainings include um, opportunities to specialize in certain areas of health, particularly those areas that are most prevalent to the communities we serve. Those those communities that we serve have been greatly impacted by some of the chronic diseases you see on your screen, including asthma, diabetes, and cancer. Uh, we have CHWs who've been prominent in working in maternal child health, uh, as well as in infectious diseases like HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and STDs. We also have community health workers who work closely and hand in hand with youth workers and street workers around being violence inter interrupters in domestic violence and youth violence and also in suicide and sexual assault. Next slide, please. During my years as a community health worker, I've worked closely with representatives of our state health and Medicaid agencies, among others, as part of equitable partnerships where we supported and valued each other's voice. Fostering these kinds of equitable, equitable relationships and partnerships with community health workers um, and ensuring our representation of CHWs in our networks and associations is a critical role in being an effective advocate for community health workers. Um, we also urge states to work on uh, having an appreciation and understanding of the different ways to support, sustain, and finance community health workers, as well as ways to support CHW leadership within the state. And we'll talk a little bit more later about some of the ways that states have been doing that. Next slide, please. Thank you. Darrell, after I will provide an overview of what certification is and its key components, as well as the different approaches that states across the U.S. are taking as they develop their uh, certification programs. Next slide, please. So um, in recent years, there has been um, increased interest in certifying CHWs. And, and while there is a general consensus among different stakeholders about the importance of CHW certification, there is a tremendous inconsistency in um, stakeholders' understanding of certification, both in, in terms of the perceived benefits as well as the concerns. Um, those who are interested in pursuing certification often see it as a way to indicate to potential employers that a CHW has certain skills. There's often the assumption that having certification in place will help increase hiring of community health workers and make health care providers more comfortable having this workforce as a member of their care teams. 
And to mention some of the concerns around certification, um, particularly among CHWs themselves, is that it may create new barriers for entry and, and place restrictions on what they are allowed to do, uh, while employers and payers worry at times that there might be um, increased pressure on them to pay CHWs uh, more than they typically do. Next slide, please. So as of 2020, there are 17 states that have implemented a CHW certification program, and many more are in the process of developing or a program or at least are considering it. Um, and as you can see on this map, states are pursuing CHW certification in a number of different ways, both with and without the health department as the administrative body, um, as well as with and without legislation. That being said, it's also important to recognize that this map does not represent a defined process. In other words, although certification is certainly an option, it may not be the most appropriate path for uh, community health worker workforce development. And it's critical for states to um, define the ultimate objective they're working towards um, with their various stakeholders, including community health workers themselves, to make sure that the certification is pursued in a way that aligns with those goals. Next slide, please. For, for states that have implemented um, certification programs so far, it is the only form of credentialing that has been um, implemented. Uh, it is a potential mechanism to help assure stakeholders that community health workers are proficient in certain crucial capabilities. And ultimately, certification is a declaration by some authority that an individual has certain qualifications. Um, it is not the same as a license and is not necessarily a certificate of completion. Um, it's also important to note here that certification is not necessarily a state government uh, function and can be led by administrative bodies from CHW associations and can also be employer uh, based. Um, We've heard earlier about CHW training standards. I want to make the distinction here that CHW certification requirements are not the same as training standards. And having completed CHW core competency training program um, does not mean that an individual has become a certified CHW um, unless the state or another certifying body says it is so. Next slide, please. So there are key steps that would be important to consider in the development of a certification policy. And this is based on the experiences of most states that have implemented um, certification programs so far. And an early step in the process must be to define the uh, community health worker workforce. And, and that involves establishing an agreement and clarity around scope of practice and what certification means, uh, which is particularly important because there are many different understandings of what certification means. It's also important that stakeholders from different sectors come together to build a common objective for what they're aiming to achieve through certification. Um, also critical, the CHWs themselves are involved both in defining the scope of practice and certainly have a leadership role throughout the certification process. Um, also important to create a responsive certification process uh, in order to ensure that the nature of practice is, is respected and that it stays rooted in the community. Next slide, please. So there are general options to consider when thinking about what kind of certification program to develop. Uh, but it's also important to note that these different options are not mutually exclusive. Um, one of the options is to certify individuals who already work as community health workers. Most commonly, this route would regulate who may use the title of certified CHW, uh, but would not regulate the actual practice. Now, the other decision along with this is whether this will be a voluntary or mandatory certification, uh, which are called title versus practice certification. Generally speaking, the best practice um, adopted by most states so far is that certification is not mandatory, so it doesn't limit people for working um, from working as community health workers because they don't have the certification. Another common option that has been used by states is to certify or credit training programs or the certifying body um, that train the community health workers. And a less co a common path that has been adopted uh, by a couple of states is certifying instructors um, that work in CHW training programs. And just want to mention the last option here, which is certifying employers. Um, 
However, no states has uh, taken this approach so far, and this is uh, primarily due to the fact that this path would not be portable uh, for CHWs, which is um, one of the most desired aspects of um, certifying among community health workers. Next slide, please. Here are the basic components um, that you need to have for implementing a certification program. Um, one of the first components is to determine who has the certifying authority and where it will be located. The certifying entities can be a state entity, a CHW coalition or association, a nonprofit or a, an independent certifying board. Um, there are various models that have been used across states and best practice in terms of composition has been that about half of the certifying body be comprised of community health workers, um, although some do have less than that. Uh, there should also be an administrative body that can manage um, a registry of certified CHWs, uh, manage the flow of applications um, and, and recertifications and, and so forth. It's also important to define community as workers and their core competencies. Um, these decisions are often based on definitions and, and, and competencies used in other states or those that are defined by APHA and the C3 project. Um, and state defined scope of practice typically outline a range of CHW roles and related tasks and activities. CHWs may perform some or all of those roles uh, depending on their uh, jobs. States also typically um, set eligib eligibility requirements and standards as well. However, the specific um, requirements do vary across states. Next slide. And finally, this brings us to a critical part of the discussion about certification, and that is um, a certification program is to be CHW centered. Um, it's important to create a system in such a way that the workforce remains rooted in the community. And some of the key elements to consider include offering multiple paths to entry. For instance, the grandparenting path allows CHWs to qualify for certification based on their past experiences. Now, other important considerations include ensuring that the application process is user friendly and that trainings are offered in easily accessible platforms. Um, and most importantly, the certification system needs to um, have a demonstrated respect for community health workers. The lived experiences of community health workers and their built-in community connections lie at the heart of what makes the workforce so valuable um, and the process needs to ensure that it is not um, creating any barriers to entry. Next slide. Thank you. Great. So I will move us into our next chapter, which uh, we will run through a collection of financing mechanisms that are available or in use, as well as the benefits and limitations of each. So first to frame, I um, wanted to first emphasize that there's a variety of options and no single solution to robust financing for CHW positions, um, but we encourage states to pursue what we call both and approach. Um, meaning that it's helpful to have a collection of strategies and states can decide which to pursue based on their own unique context. Um, Medicaid sits the closest to governmental public health, but it isn't the only option, nor is it a prerequisite. So both and approach. Um, the first option is grant funding for CHW positions. Um, this is, seems to be by far the most common way to fund um, community health worker salaries and time, um, for example, CDC offers 1815 funds or states may have contracted positions. Uh, the benefits to this is that, and I apologize, there's a train going by outside. Um, this is very flexible, uh, so it can cover time that CHW spend on the relationship building and outreach activities that are so core to community health workers uh, role um, and not just the discrete billable tasks that might be paid by an insurance mechanism. Um, the drawback is of course that grants end, so there may be inconsistent funding um, and sustainability can still feel like an uphill battle. The second option is provider funded positions through core operating budgets or community benefit dollars. Um, often we've seen this begin with a pilot or demonstration um, with the cost benefit analysis um, and if successful, then that can drive broader health system investment in CHW positions. Um, like grants, the benefits to this is that 
it can cover a broad range of services that community health workers are delivering and has that built in flexibility. Um, however, one of the challenges can be that the decision making to pursue this as a funding strategy is internal to the health system. Um, it can require public health to have to invest a lot of time in relationship building. Um, and the true return on investment of community health workers often is beyond a single budget cycle or has a longer term horizon. Um, so the next two that I'm going to mention are both strategies involving Medicaid. Um, the first is uh, using capitated rates to support community health workers. Um, this is in place in New Mexico and Pennsylvania. Um, Medicaid managed care organizations or MCOs can also pay CHW salaries as administrative expenses. Um, this is attractive because community health workers can support MCOs quality improvement and care coordination efforts, but often MCOs are hesitant about potentially adding any administrative or other expenses. Um, and so that may constrain innovation and risk taking. Second, um, we've seen some states change their Medicaid managed care contract language uh, to require that community health worker services are available within their plan offerings. Um, for example, in New Mexico, um, the MCOs must include uh, community health worker services in their benefits package. Uh, same in Michigan, um, community health workers or peer support specialists are required to be available for certain members. Um, or in a less uh, prescriptive approach, some states uh, might just encourage MCOs to offer this. Uh, for example, in Virginia and Rhode Island, uh, managed care organizations in their bids must identify for the state how they've engaged community health workers or more broadly address the social determinants of health. Um, the pro here is that again, this allows community health workers to be flexible in what they do day to day for their members. Um, also, this doesn't require a federal approval, such as by a CMS. Um, however, this can be a, a lengthy or cumbersome process, much like turning a ship. Um, the actual process uh, for this would vary by state, but it might require legislative approval. Um, and it's also a very time specific process. So there's a specific window in which the contract negotiation period takes place and that would be the opportunity to change a contract. Once it's in place, you would have to wait for that window to open up again. And then um, we've also seen hiring of community health workers supported through Medicaid uh, 1115 demonstrations. So um, there's a wide range of possibilities to integrate community health workers into healthcare uh, delivery reform. Um, New Hampshire and Oregon are two examples of states that have funded CHW or peer support specialist positions um, using these $1115. Um, the benefit here is that there's a wide range of options. Um, community health workers could be supported for the full range of activities, uh, not just discrete billable services. However, uh, this option does require federal approval by CMS. Uh, these demonstrations are by their very nature time limited and they also have to be budget neutral, which does bake in um, some limitations on what money can be used for. And then our last example here is uh, pursuing reimbursement for or payment for CHWs through a Medicaid state plan amendment. Uh, so the state plan amendment is basically the vehicle through which a state would tell CMS how they plan to operate their own Medicaid program. For example, they could add in an optional benefit. Um, Minnesota and Indiana are two examples of states that have state plan amendments that allow them to reimburse for uh, CHW delivered services. Um, the pro here is that unlike an 1115 waiver, uh, a state plan amendment would be permanent. Um, the con here is that it is often more challenging to achieve this than some other payment mechanisms because of the, or it can be more challenging and also it only covers a very narrow uh, window or range of services for community health workers. So to be reimbursed, it has to be a preventive service recommended by a licensed provider, involve direct patient care, and address a physical or mental health issue. Um, and then to really underscore this point, 
um, this slide shows that just how much, how limited this payment mechanism would be. So you can see that a state plan amendment wouldn't allow coverage for the range of activities that are really central to the values of the community health worker workforce. Um, Darrell had mentioned the core competencies, which are again shown on the right side of your screen here. Um, so a state plan amendment could offer a foot in the door since community health workers would be bringing in revenue, um, but it can't be the only approach, which brings me back to that initial slide of states really do need a both and approach to have a robust financing plan for community health workers. Thank you so much, Anna, and thanks to Taekwon. And hello everyone again. During this presentation, you've heard about CSUB skills, core roles, our nationally recognized definition, state-based certification efforts, and about some CHW financing and sustainability efforts. Okay, we can all take a breath now, because that's a lot. But to model the guiding principle of nothing about us without us and CSW self-determination, ASTO asked and engaged a community health worker, me, to join them during this presentation um, and to join um, this team. And I think that's an homage to what we're asking all of you to do to consider as you move forward with your CNW, CHW endeavors. I will now talk about how critical it is to have CHWs active, engaged, leading, guiding, and informing all of the areas we've covered in this presentation. Um, and in the other presentations you also have heard today. Next slide, please. Um, here are some selected examples of how some states have supported CHW leadership and engagement in the CHW workforce. Um, and policy development efforts and initiatives. First, I want to applaud the community health worker section again for developing, as you see on the right side of your screen, some um, CHW policy statements over the years uh, 2001, 2009, 2014. You now see an example of the 2014 uh, APHA policy statement they developed entitled Support for Community Health Worker Leadership and Determining Workforce Standards for Training and Credentialing. And it really focused on um, encouraging states governments and other entities who are drafting policies related to CHW training, uh, standards, credentialing, workforce development uh, to include uh, community health workers as, as at least half the members of that board. So thank you very much. Next slide, please. Um, last year, um, we launched on this screen, we really wanna just embrace CHW self-determination and take a moment to talk about CHW associations, alliances, coalitions, networks. Uh, last year, we launched the, the, the National CHW Association, uh, representing and supporting CHWs nationally while looking to sustain the workforce with innovations, et cetera. Uh, you can learn more about NACHWA at NACHWA.org um, and during our annual meeting next month. There's approximately 46 either local, state, or regional CHW networks, associations, coalitions, or alliances around the country. Um, some of them have uh, meetings coming up. That's one of the ways uh, you can link with, connect, and support these associations. I know South Carolina, Louisiana also have meetings coming up. CSW associations play a critical role in supporting the CSW scope of practice um, in technical and, and capacity building as well within the field uh, and for organizations and entities that employ CSWs. CHW serve as a resource, um, I'm sorry, CHW networks serve as a resource to CHWs to our allies and partners locally and also now nationally. And we also serve as partners in CSW workforce uh, development, credentialing, and financing. So once again, these networks and associations can play a critical role in supporting your efforts in your state. Um, CHWs also CHW networks also support individual CHWs, CHW programs, local state health departments, and other organizations. Uh, next slide, please. I mean, we really wanted to end um, after um, all of this information was shared with you with just a few resources. Um, these links will actually lead to additional links for resources. And we also wanted to share with you our contact information. We know we went through a lot of information fast, but we're all available and accessible to follow up. And next slide, please. And in closing, we wanna um, let you know that if you'd like to receive continuing education credit for this activity today, please visit ryanwhite.cds.pesec, 
gce.com. Um, thank you all for your time today, and I hope to engage all of you in some questions and answers during the live session. Thank you.